Matthew chapter 5. Mentioning this, 
is that uh, even in his own time of trial, he made sure that his disciples were safe. He made provision for them. He made sure they were not arrested with them. He loved them to the end of his earthly life. And uh, all his instruction and correction was in the light of that intense love. I was going to proceed from that point, but I felt it would be better to follow a kind of chronological order and come back to the very beginning of Christ's calling of his disciples so that we could see how his uh, shaping of them was consciously affected from the very moment of their calling. So first of all, if you could turn back to John's Gospel, chapter 1, and we'll look fairly quickly at a number of these things. In John chapter 1 and verse 35, again, the next day after, after John stood and drew his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And they knew what that meant. They knew that he was identifying Christ as Messiah. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. But we're not to understand by this that they followed him permanently and in a decided way just yet. They followed him to inquire further from him, to find out uh, what he intended to do. Uh, they greatly respected John the Baptist, and they heard him identified as Messiah. But they would wander from him for a day or two yet, and there would be a second and even a third call for some of the disciples. Verse 38 of John chapter 1, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. And they came, saw where he dwelt, and was staying, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So they spent hours with the Lord. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his brother, verse 41, Simon, and said unto him, and these are very significant words, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted to Christ. He was sure of it. This was something uh, which uh, was amazing for <coughs> Galilean men when uh, right at the very beginning, before Christ was publicly identified or had begun his public ministry, Galileans were used to the idea that they were uh, a relatively obscure people among the Israelites, among the Jews. And yet he, uh, an individual with one companion who was probably the disciple John, but he isn't named, and that's customary for John in his gospel, never to name himself, that such people, and fishermen only, with no status in society, should find themselves introduced by John the Baptist to the one who was Messiah. And after talking to him, he became all the more convinced. And he brought Simon, who was to be called Peter, verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. It was Christ identified his parents. There's no indication that he was introduced that way. And uh, Simon would have been taken aback that he knew him. That's the idea of this being recorded. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. That means Peter, and that would be his name. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee. This is just the initial call of some of the disciples. And findeth Philip, and said unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and he found Nathaniel, and you know this record, but I'm coming to the point in a moment. And in verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
Now that's also a remarkable statement. Moses spoke of the one who would come, who was the Messiah. He called him a prophet like unto himself, but he indicated in his language that he would be the promised descendant uh, that uh, was promised originally to Abraham, the expected Messiah. And uh, also the one who was spoken of in all the prophets. So he was sure of it. And he comes to Nathaniel and he tells him this. But Nathaniel's answer in verse 46 is, is a perfectly good one. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now Nathaniel, it turns out, was a pious Jewish young man who studied the scriptures and he would have understood that Christ should come from Bethlehem. He, there's no indication, of course, that he would in fact come from Nazareth. And uh, so he, he asked, it's in good faith. Don't think that he's asking in the wrong spirit. Can there any good thing, anything as wonderful as Messiah come out of Nazareth? We don't read of that. Philip didn't know the answer to that. He simply says, come and see. Once you've spoken to him, once you've heard him, you'll know, you'll realize. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now that may not seem very <coughs> significant to you, first of all, but how was the Lord to know that? He, unless he was in fact Messiah, the divine Lord who knows all things. Nathaniel comes to him, just written on his face, that he's an earnest, studious Jew, looking for Messiah. That was quite unusual at that time. It was a time of great unbelief, and you are a very serious man, Christ <coughs> him. And a student of scripture, he says, in effect, and you're perfectly sincere. There is no uh, uh, double thinking with you, you really want Messiah to come. And Nathaniel was taken aback. Verse 48, he said, Whence knowest thou me? And it was true. He was a very conscientious and searching young man. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now that superficial reading doesn't sound all that amazing, but it is to Nathaniel. Before Philip called, where he stayed, and uh, began to tell him about Jesus of Nazareth, who was surely Messiah, that's exactly what he was doing, meditating under a fig tree. How was Christ to know that? And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. When you put all these terms together that are used of Christ, the one who's prophesied in the prophets, the one who Moses pointed to and expected, the one who is the Son of God, divine, the one who is the King of Israel, all these different things. It gives you an insight into how much that little band of disciples really knew about Messiah. These, these were unusually serious young men and students of Scripture, and they'd heard, of course, John the Baptist, at least two of them, were his kind of unofficial disciples, and had followed him and listened to his preaching. So they were well uh, endowed with understanding of Messiah and what it would be like and how he would come. And Christ promises that you'll see much greater things. Now I'm turning back to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 4 and verse 18. I'm really elaborately setting the scene. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, previously he had seen Christ up in the fabric. Walking now by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. But of course he knew them. He had met them before. We see it in John chapter 1. And they knew men. And they'd been deeply impressed by him. And they believed he was the Lord, the Messiah. 
but they hadn't become yet permanent followers, truly attached. Verse 19, here comes a more formal call from Christ. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He was to repeat that a little later because it appears, as we read the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, that even at this stage, Peter had not become a permanent disciple, nor John, nor the others, but they'd gone back to their fishing and to their nets. And then there is that great event recorded in Luke 4, but I'm running ahead of myself, of how uh, Christ, uh, by his command, they caught a great shoal of fish, and the boat began to sink, and Peter called out, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. And it was that that led to his permanently uh, disposing of his business, or whatever he had to do, and following the Lord. So he isn't doing that quite yet. However, this is, if you like, the second overture, the second call to Peter, verse 19, I will make you fishers of men. How much would they have understood from that? Possibly not very much. If Christ was to be Messiah and he was to gather a great following, they assumed that that meant as we often remind ourselves that Christ would uh, make the Jewish nation strong and prosperous again and there would be a great earthly rule and a return, widespread return to faith in the Lord and uh, it would nevertheless be a, a kind of civil also and earthly administration. Does this mean I will make you fishers of men you will be among those who help, dare I use the word, recruit people, gather people, initiate them, certainly in the formative stages. But they understand that their role will be in some way proclamation. Well, we're from Galilee, we're from these parts. Presumably we'll be as regional recruiters. They wouldn't expect at this stage even if they have in mind an earthly takeover of the country by peaceful means, hopefully, but they wouldn't expect that they would be sitting in state in Jerusalem. They would work for him in Galilee, something along those lines. And verse 20, they straightway left their nets and followed him, but not on a permanent basis. They could abandon everything if they were going back to it, which they evidently did if we understand the order of events and that the Luke 4 incident follows this. How long afterwards? Quite soon? Maybe days? And then verse 21, going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who probably been the other disciple of John the Baptist, who came to him on that day with Andrew, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship with their father. They didn't abandon the family business because they had in mind they would be going back that night or the next day. They weren't yet permanent disciples or followers. And then look at verse 23. They're with him for the time being. And something happened which has a very formative effect on them. Verse 23. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, repentance and remission of sins, we're told elsewhere, and healing all manner of sicknesses. The disciples, the fledgling disciples, the small band of them, not permanent, not fully made up yet, are astonished. Galilean working men, and they're witnessing close up miracles of healing on every hand. And thousands of people were coming, the record proceeds to tell us. And all kinds of dramatic healings. People who knew were having limbs virtually rebuilt in split moments before their eyes. And all manner of disease among the people. And naturally, verse 24, his fame went throughout all Syria 
and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, that were paralyzed, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. But Decapolis, the city southwest of the Sea of Galilee, there were many occupied by Greek and Roman people and pagan Canaanites. So it's remarkable the international nature of the crowds that made the Jews, of course, from the entire land and region were flocking to him. The effect of this upon the disciples would have been extraordinary. If you seldom been out of your own region, the disciples knew the lake side, they knew Capernaum, of course they'd been on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but they wouldn't have been far. They were very uh, country people and working people. And they were Galileans too. They were not the elite among the Jews and didn't expect it in that very stratified society to have special privileges and power and authority and notice. And here they were as the close companions of one who was the centre of attention from thousands upon thousands of people. People who were grateful to him, people bringing their sick of all kinds. It was astounding the effect that the ministry of Christ immediately had upon the land, and they were at the heart of it. What must have been going through their minds? They still had very much their own ideas of what the kingdom of God would be, thinking, yes, everybody would be more spiritual, more devoted to the Lord, live better lives, but at the same time, it would have a largely uh, national, physical dimension also. And they're beginning to think, we may be quite sure, well, if we support the Messiah and we help him all we can, we'll do it in a sacrificial way. Well then, at the same time, it'll be very pleasant for us to be at the crest of the wave of this tremendous reformation which is going to take place and all that will happen. And they've never had opportunity to feel so special before. I hope I'm not sounding patronising, but you can just imagine the situation and the shaping of the disciples in that context begins straight away with the Sermon on the Mount. If you see the Sermon on the Mount in that context, the disciples getting a glimpse of their new calling and the possibilities and all that may happen, what is Christ going to do to steady them up? to bring them down to earth, to show them the reality, to show them what's important. How will he go about it? The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was two things. It was first and foremost to the disciples, as we see. But at the same time, it was public. What was told to the disciples, if chapter 5 tells us, he seats them around him and he addresses them. And there were vast multitudes at the bottom of the hill and around the lower parts of it, listening also. But they're aware that he's speaking to his disciples. What a curious, you might think, man of instruction. My message, Christ seems to say to the great crowd, is to these. These are my special disciples. This is my heart to heart to them. Their instructions, their marching orders, the standards they've got to follow, but I want you all to hear. Because while it's for the disciples, this is my public manifesto. I'm going to tell you, everyone, what I expect of my disciples. The kind of people my disciples will have to be. So he's instructing them and he's publicly announcing the character of his ministry. What he will do how he will go about it, and how he expects his disciples and his apostles to behave. See the Sermon on the Mount in that context, and see it as the first phase of the Lord's instruction to shape his disciples. 
No doubt these things were repeated, but this is what comes first. People sometimes think along these lines. The Lord was three years with his disciples. If only we had the syllabus. What he taught them first, what he went on to teach them, what the climax of it was. If we could just set it out like the colleges do today, the general service, how interesting it would be. Well, you can do it from the New Testament. You can trace it, you can see it. And here's the introductory part of the course. It's summed up in one sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. The lessons would be expanded and repeated. So we'll glance just an overview of this so that you can see in the context of the fact that the disciples have been called, or at least the initial group, and perhaps they get getting rather heady. They've never encountered a situation like this. They're feeling perhaps boosted and lifted up. And so the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I won't go through all of it because the first part of it is to do with uh, salvation. <coughs> And he opened his mouth, verse 2, and taught them, saying, we were looking at this in an evening service just recently. And those opening verses are undoubtedly evangelistic. And so uh, if we take it down to verse, verses 3 to 6, the poor in spirit, they that mourn, the meek, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, that's those the entry term into the kingdom of God. That's what the Holy Spirit works in us, to bring us to repentance and to faith. So it does belong first in the manifesto, the public declaration of his policies and standards. The first thing is the transition to the character of disciples. So now we're going to get a reality check. What should be the disposition of the disciples? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. They mustn't get carried away. They must be, above all, compassionate people. He doesn't touch upon morals just yet. The disposition of the disciples. They must be men and women. All believers answer to these standards of compassion. They have a care for souls and for people. They are not to be petty, hostile, domineering people. They are not to be self-absorbed or indifferent to the spiritual and other needs of the people. They are to be kindly people. Blessed are the merciful. That's the first distinctive standard in the Sermon on the Mount for the disciples and for Christian people generally. Now, when you, you're reminded once again about verse 23 of the previous chapter, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel, healing, anything that was presented to him. And the great fame of chapter 4, verse 24, and the multitudes and the disciples affected by all this, as rural Galileans, and then this is the first standard for you, to be a compassionate people, a caring people, an open-hearted people. And verse 8 continues, blessed are the pure in heart. We expect you, he says to the disciples, to be genuine people, not to have a personal agenda, not to be seeking for yourself, to have purity of taste, not to be fleshly people, greedy people, not for fame or for gain, but people who are genuine and pure in heart. And then in verse 9, the peacemakers, the bridge builders, because that is the essence of the gospel to which we witness, and among ourselves, and wherever possible, we are to be peacemakers. So you're getting, it is a reality check for the disciples, 
Oh, no, 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 the Lord says to them, uh, you're not going to be uh, serving me by being officers of state with responsible for huge regions and areas, working from a dizzy height. My followers and my disciples answered him to entirely different characteristics, compassionate and genuine and peacemakers. In fact, verse 10, they'll be persecuted. You will represent not only a good healer, you will represent one who preaches constantly about sin and the need for repentance and remission of sin. And that will be extremely unpopular. And persecution will come and much hostility. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake and willing to be for the kingdom of God's sake. And verse 11 follows, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. And that will happen in every age to Christian people. Verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven because you do it for the Lord of glory and for souls and you're on that track which will bring about the offence of the cross. So it's disposition of the disciples. You can see it, surely. It's clear here. They must, before we even get to moral teaching, what is the dispensation of a Christian man, the, the disposition rather, of a Christian man or Christian woman? What is his character? What is his stance in life? And he proceeds, so here's the shaping of the disciples. It's necessary for this kind of teaching to be the very first they hear from him as disciples. Verse 13, he is saying, where within shall be salted. You've got a high calling, and how quickly you could fall from it and lose your character and become a heady person. He could be speaking to ministers. He could be speaking to church officers. He could be speaking to any of us. So quickly you can lose that distinctive disposition and character and your message also. It's like salt. If it's no good, then it's only fit to be thrown on the pathway to clear the weeds. It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men to clear the ground and it can so easily happen to you so you have to watch your disposition and your manner all the time and verse 4, 14 this is what it's about you are to be busy people always proclaiming at home in public ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You must always be proclaiming. At home, whenever the opportunity is given, as a church, as individuals, as ministers, always to be proclaiming. Saved to serve is a familiar phrase, but one that you pick up quite a lot in much older books is based right on this, saved to shine as lampstands for the Lord. And then that follows down like it's verse 16, a verse which is often misused, misunderstood. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And the tendency these days is for people to assume that that refers to compassion, good works. Good works, as the Lord phrases it here, are works of compassion. Well, works of compassion, of course, are good works, but that is not what the Lord is speaking about here. It can't possibly be in the context, because the immediate context is that of a lamp, trans translated a candlestick, somewhat unfortunately in our King James Version uh, but the Greek is a lamp and a lampstand and 
on the lampstand and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light, it's about message. <coughs> this whole chapter is about message and manner, or at least up to this point. Message and manner of communicating, of relating to people. Let your message and your manner so shine before men that they may see that those are your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They won't all do that by any means. We've already been warned that there will be persecution. And those who are affected by the message of the gospel will glorify our Father which is in heaven on account of our witness. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Verse 17, well now, we're into morality from this verse on. Character, morality. So we've been talking about disposition and manner. Now we can come to a third heading. Verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I will be accused of that, the Lord may well have said. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What law is he referring to? Is he referring to the ceremonial law? Or is he referring to the moral law of the Ten Commandments when he utters these words? Well, it's fairly clear that he's referring to the commandments, the moral commandments, and not the ceremonial law. Because down in verse 20, he sums it all up by saying, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, he shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There, righteousness is entirely ceremonial. And he also must be not only until Christ suffers and dies on Calvary, not only ceremonial, but it must be moral. It's the moral law that is clearly in mind in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets as I bring new things and in the course of time you will suffer and die on Calvary's cross and be raised from the dead and the New Testament church will come into being. But the moral law will go on. And it will be the standard for Christian people. In the original trustee of our church, there were words along these lines that we are under the moral law of God. Now, of course, we cannot be saved by obedience to the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. The moral law is not a way of salvation. Salvation is by grace alone. And this is a free gift of God. But once we are saved, it is what James would call the royal law of liberty. And there is a new heart given to us, and it is our desire to obey the moral law of God. We are still under the moral law, not as a way of salvation, but as our voluntary desire. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, Christ will suffer and die on Calvary and he will live a life of perfect obedience which embraces us and is imputed to us for salvation. So he fulfills the law in that sense. And verse 18, the famous verse, of verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. One jot being the smallest Hebrew character and tittle being the smallest accent in the Hebrew writing and not one tiny part of the written, published, moral law of God in the Ten Commandments will pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That is the new heavens and the new earth then it will stand forever on a different basis. So verse 19, here is the moral instruction of the disciples who 
whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. That should not set us off on a, uh, an excursion to find which is the least of the commandments. It's a manner of speaking. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, which is either a way, a way of saying he won't even be there, or if he is there, well, it will be by grace alone, because he made a terrible mistake. We will never take away one of the moral commandments of God. Those people who call themselves New Covenant teachers, and they're Christians, I think, and they believe the gospel, but they believe that the law of the Ten Commandments is not the standard for the Christian church. In practice, the only difference this makes is they get rid of the Sabbath commandment, and they don't keep it. But those people are in very great danger of falling foul of verse 19. In fact, they do, I'm sure of it. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these, these commandments, and shall teach men so, teaching people that the Lord's day is not binding on the Christian church. What a tragedy that is. And yet they believe the gospel. We have to be very careful of foolish things like that. Verse 25 says unto you the verse I read, your righteousness and your conscientious seeking for godliness has got to be sincere. Internal sins, external sins. So the disciples are, have been instructed about what must be their humble disposition and now their moral obedience. And this is the first phase of their instruction. And here are some concrete examples of the time just to skim over one or two very quickly. Verse 21, he have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. <coughs> the mind asked what's the, what's the matter with that? Is the Lord going to contradict that? Well, in a measure, he is. He's referring to the tra traditional teaching of the Jews, not what is in the scripture, but what it has been customary for the rabbis to teach. Thou shalt not kill, or fine. It's a commandment. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Does that not follow? Why does the Lord appear to be faulting this? Well, because he seems to be saying the trouble with the traditional teaching is that it doesn't say enough about the commandment, thou shalt not kill. It limits it to the act of killing. And it shouldn't be limited to the act of killing. No, it shouldn't be. If we read Moses very carefully, we find that Moses extends the murder sin to other things. And I often mention this by kidnapping. Or taking away somebody's self-respect and happiness and murdering them in that sense. A husband who may destroy his wife's happiness by being overbearing and intolerable. Or a wife who may destroy her husband's happiness by some means or other. Well, all that is in Moses. And what the Lord does is take them back to the full teaching. Verse 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And he elaborates on that. Whoever has an insulting attitude and verbal abuse which puts people down and hurts people sorely is in a sense a shadow of the murder sin is just serious also. And so the Lord is, is warning the disciples that their morality mustn't be limited to the extreme manifestation of any family of sins. And so murder 
is the only sin in the murder family. Hatred is also. And so he's not uh, defining the Old Testament, but the traditional teaching that limited itself to the most superficial observance of the Old Testament law. And then he does exactly the same, a little further down. As he said, he had heard that it was said by them of all time, this is our traditions that go right back, the oral traditional teaching of the Jewish teachers, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes, but they limited adultery to the act of adultery. Verse 27, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Heart sins, as well as acts. And here is the instruction to the disciples about morality. Disposition first, you've got to be compassionate people, merciful people, genuine people, pure and single-minded. And you've got to be moral people. And practically, verse 29, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And the application of that to the disciples was obvious. If there is anything you do which brings you under temptation, you would better cut it out. If a person has alcoholic tendencies, they better not stand outside the club. They'll take bottles into their home. In fact, you shouldn't as a believer anyway. But it's obvious, isn't it? Don't put yourself in the way of temptation. Be a very conscientious disciple. You've got to be clear of all sin. And if you've got a weakness, Make sure that you know yourself and you don't expose yourself to sin and that you steer clear of that. If you are the kind of person who simply cannot, cannot, cannot turn the television off, best get rid of it and lose your faith or your communion with God. If you can turn it off, well and good. But you can interpret the the illustration any way you wish. But this is the initial instruction of the disciples. You have a great calling. Follow me. I will give you a ministry of gathering in the people. You will be my companions and helpers. Now, where loosely human nature begins to rise. Now, down to reality. Watch your demeanour. Watch your disposition and your manner. Did you think, oh, these things, are, this isn't a moral matter. Some people are not compassionate, not very kindly, not, but is that sin? Ah, their first lesson was all about disposition. Christians aspire for a particular disposition. A humble, outgoing, <coughs> compassionate, understanding, not heady, not conceited disposition. And then the second part of the instruction is the model. Our time is well up. If I do another study on this subject, I will go to quite different factors as we look a little later in the ministry of Christ, especially towards his disciples. But do see the Sermon on the Mount in that context. It will produce for you. And let's apply these things to ourselves and to our own lives. Let's put it in the